Hey, Scott. Hey, Rebecca. You know, everybody loves true crime. They do. It's everywhere. It's like Hulu, Netflix, podcasts everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. Most of my clients, when I ask them what podcast they listen to, it's almost always true crime. And today we have a guest on today that is going to share his history and his story with you. His name is Jim Buffington, and it is his story as a victim of true crime. And now he works for Bridges to Life, um, which is an organization of prison ministry. So it's very cool. We do want to give a little um, warning that we are usually a very family friendly podcast, but today we kind of dip our toe into the PG 13 side of things. Well, and just with some of the facts of the case that he had to share. Right. He so. does share some facts of the case. And so we wanted to give you a little heads up that this might be the one, the one that you don't want your little kids to listen to. Uh, usually that's not the case, but we wanted to let you know. So without waiting any longer, please just enjoy this podcast with Jim Buffington. Great story of forgiveness. You're going to love it. Here's Jim. Jim Buffington, thank you so much for joining us on Hardy Party of Five and a Half. It's we have known you for 30 years pretty easily. We were, we were all 10 years old, weren't that's we? Must yes. have been. <laughs> but we did, and we knew you had a, a connection to a prison ministry, but we didn't know why. We didn't know your story until we saw you on 70 times seven and watched the episode about you and your family. So we want to dive into that and hear more about, tell us about what was your family like growing up? Sure. Well, we, we grew up in a Southern Baptist church in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, my, my parents were actually on staff at the church. Um, my dad was back then, they called it minister of music, uh, the worship leader today. Yeah. And my mom was the church pianist and I've got two younger brothers and quite honestly, great memories growing up. It was all about church and family and mm -hmm. just being together. My grandparents also lived in San Antonio. So I, I really had what, what I know now was a very sheltered lucky upbringing that I had parents in the same house and everything seemed fine and two younger brothers and it was really church and family is yeah. what most of my memories growing up and then in sixth grade your parents told you they were getting a divorce yeah and that really surprised me uh, you know my to physically look at my parents my mom is a tall attractive lady my dad is more of a shorter stockier guy and we never heard them argue or anything like that. And so when they said they were getting a divorce, we didn't know what a divorce was because nobody right. in our family had ever been divorced. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, uh, but we really quickly learned it. It's a bad thing. And uh, one of our pastors has described, you know, when people get married, it's like you glue two, two by fours together. And, and when you, when you get divorced, it, it splits and it really tears apart everybody involved. Mm -hmm. our brothers and, and our grandparents and everybody. And, and so we were shocked when they, when they told us they got divorced, didn't understand it. But, but then um, what I've noticed is in most divorces, it turns into kind of a nasty custody fight. Yeah. And that's what happened with us for about the next year is we were bounced between dad's house and mom's house and, and back and forth. Right. Yeah. So then, yeah, about a year later, what happened in the midst of that, that just, I mean, it's already, you're already going through hard stuff, but now something even harder happens. Can you share well, that? Absolutely. So we were, uh, we were supposed to be with my mom and it was a weekend in 76, March of 76. And we were supposed to be with her because my dad was going out of town for the weekend and last minute change of plans. We ended up staying with some friends and over that weekend on a Saturday, uh, two men approached my mom at gunpoint. They, they robbed my mom, stole her purse, stole her jewelry. Um, th both of these men then raped my mom in the backseat of her car. And then one of them took a gun and they shot my mom in the face three times. And, th and they murdered my mother and, and left her without her clothes on on the backseat floorboard of her car. Wow. And deserted parking lot and uh, just really changed our life. <laughs> yeah. 
if you so will. your dad told you what was it like when he told you that all this had happened yeah it was uh so that happened on a saturday on a sunday he flies back and we were still with some friends and he he sat the three of us down my two brothers and i and told us that our mom had been found killed and um just immediate uh trauma shock fear you know i always i share with a lot of people that it's fear attached to us you know we were scared to death we couldn't believe why would anybody do this to my mom are they going to come after us um just just I, we my brothers and i were talking recently we, we remember just sleeping on my dad's floor of the bedroom because mm. we were scared to death of, yeah. of what was your dad what how was he acting during that time um anything off or everything seemed i mean it was you know we were all upset yeah um just everybody seemed surprised yeah wow Mm -hmm. so then your dad ends up getting you know arrested well these two men get arrested and your dad tell us about that sure so about a year later it was almost a whole it was actually a a year and two months and you lived with him for this year and two months yes we were living with my dad trying to get back to normal which by the way there is no normal again especially Mm -hmm. after a homicide and but we're living with my dad a year and two months later and my dad gets arrested for capital murder and criminal solicitation of hiring two men to murder my mom wow and um he was a minister but he also had a side construction business and it was two of these employees that were arrested. Um, and basically each of the two men blamed it on each other, but one of them said that my dad had hired the other one and that was a circumstantial case, but he was arrested. That's crazy. So your dad went through trial and then what happened with his verdicts? So the, uh, it took about three years. I was about 16 years old in the middle of high school before he went to trial and um, the jury found him guilty of capital murder and guilty of criminal solicitation. And they sentenced him to the death penalty. Mm. And so he was sent to Huntsville, Texas to the Ellis unit to to be executed. And, And I will tell you, everything changed for my brothers and I, you know, we had lost our mom to murder now we were going to lose our dad to be executed and and it's real different when when your mom's murdered people feel sorry for you they want to help you they want to they reach out to you church people especially our church family really just embraced us but when my dad was arrested and then convicted everything changed for us Mm. everything just changed people people treated you differently they treated us differently even you know it's funny what people will say that they, they, they don't think you can hear you or they, that we can't hear them. You know, yeah. those boys are damaged goods. They'll never amount to anything. Wow. Like, it, it's my dad that's on death row, not me. Right. Yeah. But you really get associated with your parents' bad choices. You know, mm-hmm. it affects the children. And we were just uh, a victim <laughs> of, yeah. of his bad, bad offense. And so, yeah, people treat us differently. We, uh, we actually left, we were living with my aunt and uncle in Austin. We moved to Arkansas and moved in with my grandparents where nobody knew us. Wow. And finished high school there and then went to college in Arkansas as well. In Arkansas. Wow. Cause you had also mentioned earlier that since you were a junior, you, when the, when the articles came out and the TV shows happened, it would be closely associated with you because you had the same name. We had the same name. I'm James yeah. Buffington Jr. He's senior. And, and so, yeah, it was, everybody knew your business, you know, and yeah, yeah. everybody knew your dad was on death row because it was on TV. And so, right, this happened, you know, right in the middle of high school. And so middle of my junior year, we went and moved with my grandparents and uh, really kind of had a normal life because mm-hmm. nobody knew who we were yeah, yeah. kind of it, fresh start it really was yeah. and uh, and we were very thankful for that and then uh, about my senior year in college um, the da's assistant came forward and she confessed that the prosecutor in my dad's case had altered some evidence mm. and you know at this time we we still believed my dad was innocent even though he was on death row we, we, we visited him. We wrote 
to him. We, he was part of our lives. And so he got a new trial. And so he went back to San Antonio to await a second uh, capital murder trial. Mm. And um, in that time period, right after college, Marilyn and I got married and we met up in college and we had moved to Austin, Texas and, um, and, and we're waiting that second trial. And so he was uh, eventually retried. I'm now 26 years old. And wow. he so how long have, so how long have you been involved in this so far? Is it almost so it years? happened when my mom was killed when I was 12. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm 26 years old. 14 ready, years later. Yes, we're ready for a second trial and it's right, still yeah. not over with. You know, you you still live it every day because there's you know, we're it's not over yet. It's it's not, it's just hanging over you. Yeah. Yeah. So he gets the second trial. And this time he was found not guilty of capital murder. So he wasn't ever going to get executed, which was a huge relief, you know, that we weren't going to lose my dad to an execution, but they sentenced him to life in prison on a lesser charge of murder, but he was getting parole. He was going to get, the jury already knew this. So they were going to release him and, um, and I, I know it sounds strange, but we were excited that my dad was found guilty of murder because it meant he was coming home. I always um, describe this as if you're a family member of an offender, your whole life is on hold until that person gets out of jail. Yeah. And wow. that had been our entire focus was getting him out of jail. Wow. How did, during that process, how did your brothers, how did y'all handle it differently? Well, at the time, all, you know, again, right until this, uh, all three of us uh, supported them. We, yeah. we, um, we actually were there to testify at his second trial because we were all adults and yeah. we were a fact witness on some stuff. So we testified for our dad and really thought he was innocent and supported him and so the whole focus up until this point was him you know it's, yeah. it's strange the victim of a crime gets forgotten because it all becomes about the offender hmm. oh yeah oh wow. gosh so in the process of the second trial you went to go visit your dad so tell so, us tell us what the bombshell he drops here absolutely so we we were we were so excited, and in fact, Marilyn and I, my wife, we headed to the to the jail to visit my dad with his attorney uh, as soon as the trial was over. In fact, we had testified that he could come live with us, and and so we were meeting with him. And in a trial, a lot of things come out, but a lot of things don't come out. And so I had some questions, and, and we're visiting with my dad, and we're. We're real excited because, you know, things change when you're in prison. You know, they develop a cell phone and email and he didn't know about any of those things. Technology changes. And so <laughs> we're, we're really having a good visit. But I said, Dad, um, I really got a lot of questions that, that came up in the trial. And it wasn't questions about him. It was some stuff about my mom. Mm. And he goes, Jim, ask me anything. And I get to this one question and he says, Jim, I did it and she deserved it. Wow. And it blew me away because I had just testified for him. I had supported him all these years. And, and the worst part now is he was blaming it on her. Wow. And he thought he was the victim because he was in prison. Right. And I, and it long, so right then that changed everything. And, and we turned on him. Uh, we protested his parole and uh, his parole was denied and they've revoted. And the first time they awarded it, but now they denied it. Wow. And so he went back to the Ellis unit to Huntsville to prison, not to be in death row where it's safe, but general population in a maximum security prison. And we told him, I'll be honest, we said, you will never see us again. All three, my, my, myself, my two brothers, we, we turned on him. We said, we don't want anything to do with you. His parents protested his parole. All of my mom's family, everybody turned on him. Wow. 
Oh gosh. And he went oh, back to prison. Unbelievable. That is um, so eventually you go back to see him. What what prompted you to go back to see him after all this? Well, it had been about three years and I hadn't written him. I hadn't visited him. We had no contact. None of us. Everybody he knew turned their back on him. And uh, But there's something about being the oldest boy <laughs> of your dad's, uh, you know, sons turn out just like their dads many times. And, and I was, I have the same name. I look like him. I sound like him. I act like him. And, and I couldn't figure out how did he go from a happily married man, you know, married to a, a great, attractive lady, three good boys, leader in a church. How do you go from that to a killer? Mm -hmm. And one of the things we also found out at that second trial is that he hired those two men to also kill me and my two younger brothers. And we were supposed to have been with my mom and he had hired the, these two men to kill all four of us, my mom and my brothers and I for life insurance money. It was a oh, completely oh greed. He yeah. wanted to be rich, free and single. Oh my God. So I had to go back to see him one more time to say, how did you go from a happily married guy to a killer? Because I'm just like you and I hate it. And I don't want to be like you. Mm, yeah. I needed, I needed answers. Yeah. And so, so that's what led me to go back to see him. Yeah. So what happened when you finally saw him again? Well, I, I went to go see him. And one of the surprising things is I grew up on death row. So every time you visit somebody on death row, there's a thick piece of glass and we each have a phone and, you know, like a landline and you, uh -huh. you, you talk like to you've seen all the movies, <laughs> right? Yeah. You've seen those, I think. <laughs> and so we, we, there was no contact. Well, this time he's not on death row. He's in general population. So it was a contact visit and I come walking in this room and it's open. There's no <laughs> and he thinks I'm there to, you know, the father and the son coming back together and he wants to hug me. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I dad, I, I treated him like trash. I, I'm not here to make up. Mm -hmm. I need to know how did you become a killer? Mm -hmm. And the very first thing he did to me, and it surprised me, was he said, Jim, I'm sorry for what I did to you and your mom and your brothers. And I had never, ever, ever heard him say he was sorry because he was never wrong. He was always right. Hmm. And if you have that attitude, you never apologize. Or if you do apologize, you're usually trying to manipulate somebody. Yeah. And so it really surprised me. And, and he seemed different. And, and what he told me, he said, Jim, I've not had a visit, a phone call, a letter, anything from anybody in three years. Everybody turned on him, his parents, his kids, his friends. And he said he finally hit rock bottom in prison and asked God into his life, asked God for forgiveness, and had changed. And, and guys, I will tell you, I wasn't believing it, <laughs> you know, but, I, but he seemed different mm. and he seemed remorseful. And so for the next year, once a month, I would go visit him. And um, I, I, I know this sounds odd, but I finally forgave my dad. Wow. And people, people ask about you're about to ask is how in the world do you forgive your dad who killed your mom and tried to kill you? And, and all I know is we, we work with a lot of crime victims and what I do in prison ministry. And, and if you don't forgive your offender, the person that's hurt you, you become bitter, angry, and depressed. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want my dad to control me. I didn't want to turn into that person. So I, I describe it, and again, God tells us to forgive, so that, that's also another good reminder, but it's for us. And, and, and what I've learned is I forgave my dad not to let him off the hook, but to let me off the hook mm. so I don't get eaten up with all this anger and betrayal. And, and, and so we went through this process for the next year, once a month, of really restoring our relationship and went through a forgiveness process, mm. but, but I still protested his parole when he came up every year because I'm my mom's son, you know, you don't murder yeah. a lady. You, you, so I, I stand up for my mom, but 
but I separately have a, re a relationship with my dad. I call that consequences. You know, his consequences <laughs> are going to live the rest of his life in prison, but we still restored our relationship. Did you get to the point where when he came in, you hugged him? I did. I did. did. I did. Yeah. It, it, it took a little while, but, um, but we did. And, and we were truly uh, restored, mm. but my brothers had not seen him yet. Right. And, and so, but because everybody um, responds differently, forgives differently, sometimes doesn't forgive. That's a choice. It's, it's a choice to forgive. And, and so about a year later, uh, we got a phone call and uh, it was from the chaplain at the prison that my dad had had a brain aneurysm and uh, he had been rushed to the prison hospital. Mm. And uh, what happened is he died in prison of a brain aneurysm. And um, the, the next step for us is if you're an inmate's family member, you either let the inmate be buried in the prison, <laughs> which we were not going to have that legacy in our family, mm -hmm. or you can claim the body at your expense. And um, we decided to have a, a private funeral in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when everything changed, guys. I will tell you, uh, the warden and the chaplain were at my dad's funeral. And, and wardens don't go to inmates' funerals. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, Jim, next week, we're going to have the first time ever, by the way, it's never happened since in the Texas prison system, we're going to have a memorial service for your dad, an inmate inside the prison, and we want you and your family to attend. Wow. And so the very next week, my brother, Marilyn, my brothers, our wives all headed to Huntsville. The warden gave us a tour of death row where we got to see where my dad lived there which was awful. Mm -hmm. Then we went into general population. We got to see where my dad had lived to serve his life sentence in general population. And then we went into a chapel and it's just like a regular church chapel, just except it's full of inmates in white prison uniforms. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we sat on the front row and for the next three hours, one by one, an inmate would walk up to the front of the room, grab a microphone, look us straight in the face and say, your dad shared his faith with me and I become a Christian and it's changed my life. Wow. And we heard, you know, when one person says it, okay. But when you're 300 men in white prison uniforms say that they had changed because my dad had shared a story of how he made all these bad mistakes. He ended up in prison he asked God to forgive him, took responsibility, accountability, and repented and went in a new direction. Wow. We realized it was true. And my brothers saw proof that he had changed. Mm. And, and that started the forgiveness process for them. Wow. How did you sit through that? How, how, I could see, I could get through three maybe before <laughs> yeah, I would right. be a mess. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. Emotional. It was, um, you know, one, one of the things we didn't know that we learned and my dad never shared it with me was that in prison, you have a job and, you know, there's some scriptures that talk about how God can restore you. You know, we, we've seen how he restores marriages and he restores families. And, but uh, my dad had a job in prison. He became the minister of music at the chapel. Oh, wow and started a men's choir. And so um, we just got a really good picture of restoration yeah. and forgiveness. And, and at the very end, the chaplain said, Jim, would you like to say something to these men? And I, I wasn't a good public speaker. I didn't want to do it. I just wanted to grab Marilyn and let's go home. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I turned around and I share this a lot, especially now with men in prison, is I looked at these 300 men in white prison uniforms. And the very first thing I said was, please don't judge me. I'm not judging you. I'm no better than you. You've just made a bad choice that got you in prison. Mm -hmm. and what I learned is most men in prison struggle with forgiving themselves. Mm. You know, they, they've been given a label of murderer or thief or whatever their charge is. And I just explained, you, you don't have to let your worst bad choice define you 
and be the rest of your life. Just like my dad changed, you've changed, you can go in a new direction. Yeah. And, and most people struggle with this issue of forgiveness. Yeah. So is it from that point that you, is that when you decided this is the job I'm going to have is working in prisons or when did that come about? So right after, you know, uh, it, it's, you know, our, our pastor at the time at Fielder Church in Arlington, he shared the story. A lot of our friends didn't even know that our dad was on death row, you know, and had and, and been to prison and was serving a life sentence. And, and all of a sudden I started getting asked to share this story at churches. I'm still sharing this story, which I, I, <laughs> I'm just so thankful that God still uses it, you know? Yeah. And, and that what happened is I, I got in, I was contacted by a group called Texas Victim Services, where you go into prison and you share your story on kind of a victim impact panel. I used to describe it. I go into prison, tell my story, make everybody feel really bad. And then I left. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow, what a great group. Well, I met a Bridges Life staff member on one of those panels and she invited me to a Bridges to Life graduation. And when I went to the graduation, it looked just like my dad's funeral service. At the end of the 14 weeks, every inmate walks up to the front, they get a, about two minutes and they share how they've changed, what they've learned. And I'm like, wow, people can really change. And so I started volunteering back in 2004 at a prison here in South Dallas in the Bridges to Life program. And about six years ago, I actually took over the organization. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I just started out as a volunteer. I, it was, yeah. it was no way, you know, I still had a regular business job. I was just a, a <laughs> weekly volunteer until I, I came on board in 2016, about six years so ago. So what is the Bridges to Life program? So Bridges, it's a restorative justice faith-based program okay. in prisons and rehab centers. And here's what it looks like. We actually bring victims of crime into the prison, myself, uh, four of the 14 weeks at the very beginning, we share our story. Mm. And what I have learned is every time as a victim, we share our story, we start healing. Mm -hmm. And when an inmate hears your story, they actually get empathy and see the other side of crime and get a different perspective. Okay. So over those 14 weeks, we, we meet in small groups, 10 inmates with two volunteers. A lot of times one of the volunteers is a victim of crime and it's a two hour program and we cover topics, accountability, responsibility, confession, repentance, forgiveness, hmm. restitution, how to pay back. And what happens is these are small group discussions and the inmates are doing the talking. And from week one to week 14, I see them change. And so it's a restorative justice program. Here's our results. Right now, this week, we are getting to the milestone of our 65,000th graduate of our program. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, it's 16 uh, states, seven countries. Wow. 3,200 volunteers globally. So we are a restorative justice program where, and here's the proof, we track our recidivism results, which is the return rate to prison. Most states, 30 to 50% of inmates commit another crime within three years. If they graduate our program, our rate is only 14%. Wow. So, our so most recent involved. It really, you know, they, yeah. they change. They don't commit crimes. They don't cause new victims of crime. And so it is a definite life-changing program. Yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing. incredible. That's Do incredible. you ever have any come up to you out of prison and talk to you? Uh, several of them go to church with us. <laughs> so, <laughs> and for some reason, they always want to sit next to Marilyn in church. But, you know, we, we, <laughs> we but you know what? They're, they're folks that are just, they have just made some bad choices that got them into prison. And you know what? They've served their time. They get out of prison. And one of the things my son, knows, my, our son is 32, which I know will shock you because you can't believe he's that old. But Yes, today, but he, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So he actually last week, but yes. Oh, and, uh, and so he volunteers with us. And he started volunteering about five years ago when he was 20, when he's in his 20s. One of the first things he said, and most people don't realize this, he goes, Dad, 
the, these are men I would hang out with. Oh, wow. And what most people don't realize is these men in prison, these awful men are your brothers, your kids, your uncle, you know, they're, they're, they're family members. Yeah. And so when they get out, uh, they, they really want to do well. And so, yes, I see quite a few of them all the time, either oh, at a church or on, or at uh, Walmart or yeah. the rest, you, know, just, I, you do, we do run into them a lot. Yes. Yeah. So if someone wanted to volunteer with Bridges to Life, how would they go about doing that? So they could reach out to us on our website. It's Bridges to Life. That's Bridges, T-O-L-I-F-E dot org. Oh, Bridges to Life dot org. Uh, we have staff all over the state of Texas. So if you live in San Antonio, you can click on our website and find the San Antonio Regional Coordinator or Dallas or Houston or Austin. So yeah. we, we've got staff everywhere. And uh, just reach out. There's a quick training class on uh, how to go into a prison. And then we we uh, train you on how to be a good facilitator. We, we want to have a discussion. And that's really restorative justice is about, it's really repairing the harm caused by crime. Mm -hmm. and, and when you bring the victims together with offenders, not their actual offender, but victims and offenders together, healing can happen on both sides. And I've seen it over and over and over. When I when we were talking about this, do you remember that scared straight that they used to have in the 70s and 80s yeah. yes. where it, it was just it was a lot more hostile and you were, they were trying to scare the kids and all that. But I feel like this is more of a permanent life change when you're when you're looking for forgiveness, you're looking for redemption and not just scaring people not to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it, I, look, prison's a tough spot. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I none of us would want to live there. There is no doubt about that. And it, it's a harsh place. And, and it's incredible when, when people go in, and, and this is something about being a volunteer, you don't have to be a victim. You don't even, we have even ex-offenders that come back and serve, but we've got folks, a lot of folks at our church, they don't have a victim story and offender story. They just want to help. Yeah. You sit in a small group with 10 men and two volunteers and you just want to help and you show up once a week for two hours and just listen and let people talk. It's very healing. And what we found out is our volunteers go, look, I signed up to really help these folks, but they're blessing me. Yeah. You know? yeah. And um, it's incredible the blessing we get when we serve others. Yeah. And, and it really can change a prison culture by watching other inmates go through a life change they really do transform and it's the power of the gospel it's the power of our program and it's the power of our, our of our giving and serving mm -hmm. wow. so you mentioned in the it's on shalom world right it's an app it's a free app yes yeah which is where we saw the documentary uh -huh. you mentioned talk to us about how you're honoring your dad and your mom at the same time mm -hmm. No, like great, great, great questions. Yeah. So on Shalom World, they're the ones that did the feature about my brothers and I and our story of faith and forgiveness. And, and um, one of the things that we realized is, um, you know, because we do grew up in faith and, and church and is there, there is a scripture about honoring your, your parents. And, and uh, one of the things I really get to do today is I get to share the story about my mom. Her name was Cherie. And I get to talk about her in prison and how she led me to faith at a young age and, and how she had already given us examples of how she had really um, forgiven already. She, she uh, long, a lot of details, but she knew somebody was trying to kill her, just didn't know who it was. And so okay. she had already written a funeral out and one song she wanted sung at her funeral, and oh. it's called I'll Tell the World That I'm a Christian. Uh -huh. It talks about telling your story and forgiveness. And so I get to go in prisons and talk about my mom's tree and how um, she taught us how to forgive. Wow. Oh, wow. And then I get to talk about my dad, who did an awful thing by having her murdered and trying to murder his own three kids, but, but how he changed. Mm -hmm. and, and so I get to honor the fact that my dad ended well. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we get to honor both our mom and our dad. And we've got such a great example of how God can take 
an awful, horrible, traumatic situation, yeah. but turned it into his good. Yeah. And, and we've seen so many people heal and, and, and change their lives. And it's just, it's very uh, rewarding and um, honoring yeah. to get to participate in that. Right. Awesome. That, the whole story is just incredible. And I appreciate you just, you're doing what God wants you to do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, and most of the time when we do that, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he takes us to uncomfortable places so that we can, we can heal ourselves and we can help others heal. Mm-hmm. So it's just an amazing uh, organization. And we just thank you so much, Jim, for sharing all that. And uh, just praise God. It's just, mm-hmm. it makes you want to worship to hear Yes. Your stories like this. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on and thank you for letting me share my story and also mention Bridges to Life. So yes, for sure. Anybody can reach out to us on bridges to life.org and we'd be glad to connect them. So thank you again. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much, Jim. We appreciate you and Marilyn and uh, all the best to you. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you both. You too. You too. Take care. Bye. 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 Are you holding it together, babe? I think I am. (laughs) There was a moment in there, like I had watched the documentary about Jim and his family twice. Mm-hmm. And I thought, one, to kind of research and also to kind of get used to the story. So when we actually did talk to him face to face, virtually, mm-hmm. that I wouldn't really get emotional about it. You really thought you weren't going to get emotional? <laughs> That's real funny. But there was like halfway through there when he's telling the story, I'm starting to tear up. <laughs> and I'm starting I'm starting to wonder, okay, I, I got to hold it together here. Mm-hmm. Jim's holding it together. <laughs> So, He's probably told the story thousands of times. Well, also, but also we talked to him after he called back to talk, and he said he gets emotional too. Still, yeah. all this time later, right? So I held it together, but it did. Mm-hmm. It was more emotional it than was, I expected. Yeah. You know what? It's hard for me. The story is that he's one of three boys, the yeah. oldest of three boys, and since Which we have what, three boys, yeah. it does make it a little hit hit me a little in the feels for that. Yeah, it's just so hard to even imagine. It's imagining it. It's hard to imagine it happening to you. It's mm-hmm. hard to imagine wanting to do that to someone. Right. I don't even know. I don't understand. I'll never understand the reasoning for that. Yeah. So it's also hard to imagine how to heal from that. Well, yeah. And forgive for that. And so I think his program is incredible. I'm going to go check out the website for just the life. I want to know a little more about that. Yeah. I am. When he was talking, I'm like, because when he was mentioning that you could volunteer, uh-huh. I just thought it would always be. A victim comes in and helps. Right. But he mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, he mentioned at the end that it could be anyone. You don't necessarily have to be a victim. So, yeah, I'm going to pray about that and think about volunteering. Yeah. To see what that's all about. All right. Well, hopefully you can hold it together while you're volunteering. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> yeah. We really enjoyed this interview with Jim. We hope you guys did too. Hardy Party Five and a Half, over and out. We'll see you next time.